Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. Hello, let's talk about Tom Bombadil. The most divisive part, I think, in what I see of discussions of the Lord of the Rings books, equally loved and hated section, is the three chapters, I suppose, that concerns Tom Bombadil, this strange figure who the hobbits meet not long after they leave the Shire. And it's interesting it's so divisive because it's not something where the defenders say, oh, you know, it's OK. Um, you know, I get that there's criticisms, but it's OK. It's OK. I liked it. I liked it. And then the detractors say all, all these reasons why it's bad. It tends to be that both sides have strong opinions with lots of points they want to make about it. I'm one of those who thinks Bombadil, the Bombadil sections of the first volume of Lord of the Rings are enjoyable. They're well written and they serve a function in the story. And certainly Tolkien said so. He, uh, he says as much in his letters. He said in one, I would not have left him in there if he did not serve a purpose. So this isn't going to be a video about um, Tom Bombadil's theories. This is going to be a video about the literary purpose and function of the Bombadil sections in Fellowship of the Ring. There are fun theories about Bombadil, um, who he is, what power he represents. But we're ultimately intentionally left in uh, the dark by Tolkien. I'll get to that in a second, actually. There isn't a Planet Narnia-esque, definitely true explanation. If you haven't heard of Planet Narnia, look it up. Maybe I'll make a video sometime. But essentially, uh, a, a guy came up with what is just widely accepted now to be the kind of insanely deep secret plan behind the Narnia novels. This is something that, you know, the theory stuff we can't solve, but the literary purpose and function we can actually say a lot about. I'll, I'll add before I move on, that I think it's justifiable that Bombadil was taken out of the movies, out of the Lord of the Rings movies by Peter Jackson. And that's, I talked about this in my very recent White Sand video, which is about a graphic no novel adaptation of a novel script, a novel text, that basically visual arts work differently from prose arts, you know, from, from textual arts, or strictly textual arts. Visual arts rely um, upon different pacing tropes and uh, a different understanding of time and they communicate ha what's happening to their their audience in different ways and in the context of a visual medium bombadil is, is a problem and the reason he's a problem is is not necessarily uh, because of the confusing or strange stuff but partly it's a tone thing and um, we'll get to the function the tonal function it serves in the book but because Jackson wanted to start out with kind of quite high stakes and a dark tone and bad things just around the corner and a very, very scary start with the Black Riders on the screen a lot and, you know, with this big prologue. It means that there's a, uh, in the context of a visual medium where a three, even if it's a three and a half hour film, it's relatively to be short period of time you spend watching it and things have to sort of quickly move on to keep your attention. Um, in terms of feeling like they are worthwhile. And in that case, I think something where the stakes are um, seem to change dramatically and, and become a case of, you know, almost a sidetrack from this big ring story. It's not, but it feels like that. Um, I think that's difficult. The other thing I think is, yeah, tonally, it's lighter than Jackson wanted. So you both have a sort of a, a pacing issue where you shift from this ring is very... Uh, an emergency and we have to deal with it and then suddenly there's a long section it, this is this would be the how it would come across in a film where it didn't matter and then you'd also have the thing where it seems lighter and happier than the plot deserves in a film that is meant to be quite heavy and serious with light comic relief but mostly serious so with that said i think there are at least five purposes i can see five functions purposes strengths of tom bombadil being in this book um, I don't think I can make anyone like Tom Bombadil and Goldberry if you hate that section. But hopefully we can get closer to seeing why these things are in the books and seeing why Tolkien thought they might be important. Well, the first purpose is it's just very nice writing. I, I'll read just a couple of short bits to uh, uh, remind us of that. There, here's a poem. Hop along, my little friends, up the withy windle. Tom's going on ahead, candles for to kindle. Down west sinks the sun, soon you will be groping. When the night shadows fall, then the door will open. Out of the window panes, light will twinkle yellow. Fear no older black, heed no hoary willow. Fear neither root nor bough, Tom goes on before you. Hey now, merry doll, we'll be waiting for you. 
And then even when he's talking normally, not singing, uh, he sounds like he's singing. This is him describing breakfast. Here's my pretty lady, he said, or Goldberry. He said, bowing to the hobbits. Here's my Goldberry, clothed all in silver green with flowers in her girdle. Is the table laden? I see yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk cheese and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready? Uh, the Just really quite lovely description of food, but in this musical way. Uh, it's a really lovely section. Uh, and just if you're reading it, and probably many people would agree who don't like it, oh yeah, if I was just reading it on its own, I'd quite enjoy it. Or if you listen to the pre-Lord of the Rings ballad of Tom Bombadil about him coming to marry Goldbury, they'd say, oh, well, that's lovely. And so one thing is it's just nice, and t Tolkien liked writing nice things. The Lord of the Rings is an exceptionally well-written book. Second, it's a mystery, and this is an obvious cheat, uh, but one purpose is, this is, I'm going to quote Tolkien in a letter, as a story, I think it is good there should be a lot of things unexplained, especially if an explanation actually exists. I, there may be an explanation, but it's good to leave it unexplained. And even in a mythical age, there must be some enigmas, as there always are. Tom Bombadil is one, intentionally. It's a mystery. It's meant to be something where, uh, e even in a mythical age, where you can have as much fantasy as you like with lots of things, Enigmas, enigmas, confusions, mysteries are something that happens in everyday life, something we all experience. And so them being part of the story uh, is part of our own experience of the confusion of life and the sublimity of life, the way in which life is beyond uh, what we can control. Uh, that connects to a later purpose and point. The third purpose, this is kind of narrative theory stuff. At Bombadil, the Bombadil section is in Campbell's heroic journey or his hero's journey, it is the belly of the whale. The characters step beyond the first threshold, that's the previous stage, they step as they cross the fields at the edge of the Shire and they get to Buckland and then into the old forest and they enter a liminal place. They move beyond what they know and they enter, that's the first, crossing the f first threshold, and then in the belly of the whale they enter fairy, a dark magical woodland. The old forest is fairy. And this is the first time the hobbits basically really encounter magic as magic as something strange rather than as the wonderful fireworks of Gandalf and that magic nearly kills them as old man Willow lulls them uh, into quiescence and sucks in Pippin and then Merry and then begins to crush them until Tom comes and rescues them but fairy the world beyond has things other than danger in it it has mysteries things you can't explain but some of those mysteries are good it has strange and surprising sources of power and kindness and aid and this connects actually to a different wider issue in, in talking of you catastrophe the uh, the good culmination of events where somehow somehow things come together for good things that n may not have looked good come together for good Compare Tom, for instance, to Ganberry Gan and the Druidine, or to the Eagles uh, rescuing first Gandalf and then Frodo. Think of Bayorn in The Hobbit think, uh, and the aid he offers, and the precise timings where relief armies turn up. It is not a matter of strange and lazy convenience that armies at the F Battle of the Five Armies, at Helm's Deep, at the Pelennor's Field, uh, all turn up at the right time. That's not strange, weird coincidence. It is a wider theme of the mysteries of the world, of uh, the providence of Iluvatar working to uh, bring good about, even when it seems like things are very bad. So Tom's presence teaches the audience uh, about, well, I suppose it serves that purpose of being the first strange experience of our heroes in the world and the growth they experience through it. It teaches them and it teaches us as readers how the world may work beyond here. Not that it will ever again be this uh, sort of seemingly fairy-like necessarily, except perhaps uh, briefly in Lothlorien, uh, but it will be like this. Uh, the same strictures of plot will apply, the same kinds of magic will be present in the land, uh, the same threats and the same aid will exist. And so it's a teaching section for the characters and for us. That's the third purpose. Uh, in fact, the fourth purpose. Um, the fourth purpose is music. It's poetry. Uh, I've done a video on the, the poetry in Lord of the Rings and the Tom section is one of the strongest sections for representing what music does. It brings order. It represents goodness. Um, it, it kind of reveals goodness, good things. 
it shows where hope is to be found. Um, I talked about this at length, but a major point of the poetry in Lord of the Rings is to show where good is, where evil is, uh, to show where order is and to show where chaos is by its lack. Chaos is unmusical. Order law is musical. Good is musical. So that's uh, the 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 a kind of summary purpose look at that video for more but i think it is important that bombadil is the only character who sings as an ordinary thing just that he decides to go around singing uh, and he also um, uses that sit song particularly as magic to control and order the world around him finally the biggest purpose probably is well tom is the biggest purpose his character his personality his uh, morality or whatever you want to call it in Tom, we see the key to the idea of virtue and right behaviour in Tolkien. Um, this is probably the most important thematic purpose of Bombadil. He is the fully integrated, fully peaceful, fully joyful person. I can actually make a very long video just about this, uh, about the way that Tom's personality illuminates Tolkien's whole uh, conception of good character, of virtue. But let's just take one quote about Tom by the person who knows him best. As a starter, we'll start with Goldbury. This will be the main thing I'll talk about from now on. Fair lady, said Frodo again, after a while, tell me if my asking does not seem foolish, who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldbury, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is, as you have seen him, he, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of wood, water and hill. Then all this strange land belongs to him. And no, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice, as if to herself. The trees and the grass and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. A door opened, and in came Tom Bombadil. He had now no hat, and his thick brown hair was crowned with autumn leaves. He laughed, and going to Goldbury, took her hand. I thought actually adding that paragraph would help what we're going to talk about. Goldbury says that Tom is. The, the, the basic definition of who Tom is, is that he is. When pressed, she explains, he is the master. To be the master is simply to be. It means you are, if you are the master. The two are interchangeable. Mastery and, essentially, unlimited existence are the same. And this is a book about power, about mastery, about dealing with limits on our existence. Uh, our, every evil character, every conflicted good character is dealing chiefly with those questions. Uh, the power of the ring being used to save Gondor tempts Boromir. The power to glorify the self tempts Galadriel. Saruman is tempted by the mastery over nature, available in technology. The ring grants immortality, it allows us to escape nature in that sense. Denethor despairs because he loses control or, or mastery over events and over his family. Sauron, of course, goes by the name Dark Lord. He represents himself as the master of all, the master of Barad-dûr. But Tom is the definitional master. He is. He is the definitional master in these books. Goldbury first says he is, then says he is the master of word and river and hill. But here's the crux. Tom, uh, Frodo then assumes that Tom is the local baron. Okay, so he's the master of wood and water and hill, so great. He's the baron or whatever. But Goldbury finds this idea baffling and even worrying. Uh, to be in control of the grass sounds exhausting. The grass and trees belong to themselves. The water is itself and no one else. Tom is the master, she says, because no one has ever caught him in the wood. He is the master because he is not afraid. That's a topic, this issue of fear, uh, and I'm going to give a couple more quotes here, I think, that comes up again and again with Tom. Fear is a major topic of this section. The hobbits need not fear the old forest when Tom goes on before them, he sings. I've, I've read that bit at the start. He warns hobbits against the Barrow Downs unless they are unfearful people. He says, do not you know, avoid the barrows unless uh, you are a, uh, a courageous person. And perhaps most importantly, Tom defines himself like this. 
who are you, master? Frodo says and asks in wonder. Eh, hey, what? said Tom, sitting up and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name ne yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? But you are young and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless before the Dark Lord came from outside. That's the first Dark Lord, Morgoth. Tom knew the stars and the darkness before any fear could be felt in the dark, before evil had entered the world. Tom was before fear. He is fearlessness. What does it mean for him to be fearless? Goldbury and Tom both define themselves in those terms, essentially, define him in those terms. Is he simply reckless? No. He's not afraid because he does not fear losing anything. He does not require anything. He does not need to be in control of the local land or anybody else. He is master not because he controls the grass, but because he does not control the grass and does not want to control the grass. He's the master of the wood of Old Man Willow because he is master of himself. He has no unrestrained appetite or ambition. He's complete, and therefore the land about him can be put to order by his song, by the music of the Aina, you might say. Where Tom goes, goes the fearlessness that was on Middle-earth before Morgoth entered in. Tom is in one way, then, the opposite of Saruman particularly, the exploiter who is ever afraid, ever needful of more power, ever needful of to exploit nature particularly, not truly master of it, merely exploiter. But he's also the opposite then of Sauron, of Morgoth, of Ungoliant, of the greedy part of Gollum or of Thorin, the vain part of Galadriel, the despairing part of Boromir or Denethor. He's the ideal person in these books. When you think about who, you might say, well, the hero in terms of the action is, yeah, Frodo and Aragorn and the rest, of course, but the hero in terms of personality character is Tom Bombadil. He is a model of what the hobbits must become if they are to complete their quest. And as you see in the books, the hobbits conquer the things that make them fearful till they return home and are therefore able, having completed their hero's journey, they are able to scour the Shire of Sharky's ruffians. It's no coincidence in connection to the ending that Frodo's dream of the Blessed Isle stands in for resolution, hope, peace, and eventually beyond the circles of the world, heaven. This dream, I'll, I'll, I'll read it and uh, uh, kind of to finish. That night they heard no noises, but either in his dream or out of them he could not tell which Frodo heard a sweet singing running in his mind. A song that seemed to come like a pale light behind a grey rain curtain, and growing stronger to turn the veil all to glass and silver, until at last it was rolled back, and a far green country opened before him, under a swift sunrise. Those who have watched the movie will recognise that, as think Gandalf says uh, to Pippin, as death seems imminent in Minas Tirith. It's not a coincidence that that's a dream Frodo has in Tom Bombadil's house. Um, and if you want to really start playing with what the most likely theory is, uh, think about why it's there that it happens, why he hears that sweet music there. And it's not sure, it's not clear if it's in a dream or not. Anyway, that's what I have to say about Tom Bombadil. What do you think about Tom Bombadil? What purpose do you think he serves? What do you like and dislike about the three chapters he's in in Fellowship? Tell me in the comments. Till next time.